The press were saying Bond was a passe thing. I was aware of this fallow time, that it had been dormant six years. Bond had been off the screen for so long, the Wall Street Journal said it was a $50 million gamble that just wasn't worth taking. There was a real doubt that Bond could survive in the post-Cold War environment. The world has changed. There are no enemies. So there's no need for James Bond. Pierce Brosnan, the new Bond, made his name as an action man. Now he has to prove the Bond formula and the character can still work in the 90s. There were many skeptics and cynics before I did it. Do we really need another Bond? But, you know, GoldenEye kind of shut them up a little bit. Tomorrow Never Dies is the most relentless of all the Bond movies when it comes to action. It has to be better than the last, it has to be the same, it has to be completely different. There are a lot of expectations, and it's a challenge. I thought we should finally have an interesting woman in it. Bond has to be a man of the 90s, and Waylon, the character I play, is very, very much that. Turn right! No left! We're striking! been a fan of Chinese technology. Pierce seems to be beloved by the audiences, the Bond fans and, and even non-Bond fans. This is the kind of character I want to see. I guess it was the chicks, the cars, and the cool. It's a great boy's kind of fantasy. It's all the spy stuff and the gadget trip. Uh, um, I loved all the, all the Bonds. I loved Sean and I loved Roger, and I think Pierce is, is magnificent. He's done a great job for the franchise. He turned the franchise around. <laughs> well-loved character and to be part of it is something very special i found a nice groove with the character he's just perfect just sit back and enjoy the role Take it back to the beginning. When I think back to the video games that were formative during my youth, three games come to mind. Spider-Man, Gran Turismo 2, and Tomorrow Never Dies. All for the PlayStation 1. I know, you were probably all thinking I'd say something like Pokemon Snap or Super Smash Bros. for the N64. Hell, I know you were thinking I'd say GoldenEye over Tomorrow Never Dies, being the massive fucking Bond nerd that I am, but the truth is, I actually didn't own an N64 until I was a little bit older. Seriously, I promise this all has a point. My experience with those games were only when I went to a friend's house. I was, and still am, Team PlayStation all the way, baby, but, um, right. Where was it? What was I talking about again? Oh yeah. The games that formulated my youth. The interesting thing about two of those games, Gran Turismo 2 and Tomorrow Never Dies, and my time spent with them was they almost served as an entry point for me into the Pierce Brosnan Bond films. My favorite song off of the Gran Turismo 2 soundtrack was I Think I'm Paranoid by Garbage, and would eventually lead me to discovering their work on The World Is Not Enough, and naturally, the film itself. The game for Tomorrow Never Dies, on the other hand, provided hours and hours of escape sleuthing around undercover for being the ultimate super spy, James Bond. Naturally, being a kid, I didn't care too much about the plot or the story. I was hell-bent on getting from point A to point B and seeing what incredible action sequences awaited me on the other side. I can't even begin to tell you how much I replayed that game. Even when the PS2 came out, I would still go back to Tomorrow Never Dies on the PlayStation 1. I remember the cutscenes from the film, especially the White Knight opening followed by the iconic title sequence. And the funny thing was, I hadn't even watched the damn movie until a while after. I didn't know who Elliot Carver was on screen, or who the fuck Sheryl Crow was in her apparently divisive Bond song, which I've truthfully always enjoyed. I just knew the game and the feeling I felt while playing it. Pure excitement. So yeah, when I saw the film for the first time, I was probably warmer on it than most people. 
I fucking loved it. Like I truthfully do most all of Brosnan's Bond films. Tomorrow Never Dies quickly became and still is my comfort food. It's the film I throw on when I don't know what to watch or want to be swept up in the world of international espionage. Every viewing is like reconnecting with an old friend and over time, I've not only come to appreciate the true genius of it, but the secret to how it was able to hook me at such a young age and why it stays with me all these years later. Hold the presses. This just in. In order to understand the longevity of Tomorrow Never Dies, we have to examine the circumstances in which it was made. This is Albert R. Broccoli, Cubby for short, the man with the most glorious name in all of Hollywood. If you're a Bond fan, you know him, and if you're not, well, you still know his name. Ian Fleming may have established the character, but it's Cubby, with an assist from Harry Saltzman, who is most responsible for the version of Bond we see today, almost 60 years after he debuted in cinemas with 1962's Dr. No. However, the traits of what we'd consider a Bond film didn't magically manifest overnight. Both Dr. No and From Russia With Love, while some of the best films in the series, didn't necessarily adhere to what you and I would consider to be the Bond form. It was a work in progress. It wasn't until Sean Connery's third outing, 1964's Goldfinger, that Broccoli and Saltzman discovered a winning concoction. Film critic Roger Ebert put it best, saying, The Broccoli-Saltzman formula found its lasting form in the making of Goldfinger. The outline was emerging in the first two films, and here it is complete. First, the title sequence, establishing Bond as a sex hound while linking him with a stunt sequence or a spectacular death. Then the summons by M, head of British Secret Service, and and the briefing on a villain obsessed with global domination. The flirtation with Money Penny, the demonstration by Q of new gimmicks invented especially for this next case, then the introduction of the villain, his murderous and bizarre sidekick, and his female assistant slash accomplice slash mistress. Bond's discovery of the nature of the evil villain's scheme, Bond's capture and the certainty of death, Bond's seduction of the villain's woman, and so on, leading always to a final scene in which Bond is about to enjoy his victory reward, the sensuous fruits of his latest conquest. While Ebert's words definitely pertain to the more sex-crazed films of the 60s and 70s, the general structure here is sound. And actually, perhaps the secret to its success is that it basically follows Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. While most franchises are hindered by the implementation of a formula, that wasn't the case for Bond, and it's because within the confines of that structure, there lives so much room to improvise, tailor, adapt, etc. It's a formula, no doubt, but it's also one that can be tailored to each given time period or era, and even be subverted for dramatic effect in some cases. Over the course of four decades, Cubby worked to perfect and adapt that formula with his various creative partners, pushing it in bold new directions and evolving it with the times. With his final film, 1995's Goldeneye, Cubby had not only mastered the Bond formula, but he had pushed the character and franchise into the 21st century, making him more than just Her Majesty's Loyal Terrier, but a fully formed and flawed individual ripe for exploration. Goldeneye was his masterful footnote, his legacy manifest with eyes on what the future would hold for the character. Shortly after the enormous success of Goldeneye, Cubby handed the keys to the Aston Martin to his children, Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson, before his passing prior to the release of Tomorrow Never Dies. And while both Barbara and Michael previously had a hand in the creation of a few of the past Bond films, this was the first time they'd be off on their own. The two had to almost prove themselves, to prove that Cubby's decision wasn't just another case of nepotism, but an inspired and fitting bequeathment of the franchise he worked so hard to build. Barbara and myself had to view our working life after his death as a new beginning. We have inherited what legions of fans around the world think as something of a holy grail. We also have the pressure that goes with it. Cubby never cut back on budgets, skimped on the set or first class action sequences. He always had high production values. Barbara and I have pledged to produce the films in the same way. It's therefore fitting that Broccoli and Wilson's first endeavor would be such a quintessential Bond film, a distillation of everything that came before, serving as a rite of passage for the new heads of Eon. When you go back and revisit the Brosnan era Bond films, do you ever get the feeling that Goldeneye feels slightly detached from the rest of the tenure? Obviously, it's by and large Brosnan's best film, and even a Tomorrow Never Dies apologist such as myself wouldn't argue against that, but it certainly feels as though it's more an 
extension of Timothy Dalton's previous two films than it does the precursor of Tomorrow Never Dies. Well, that's because GoldenEye wasn't originally written for Pierce Brosnan. It was supposed to be Dalton's third outing before four years of legal conflicts between MGM, United Artists, and Eon led to the premature end of Dalton's time as James Bond. GoldenEye effectively closes the book on Bond's time during the Cold War. His role as a figure who fought for England was forged in contrast to the enemy. So even when the stories weren't about the kind of tensions of the Cold War, it defined Bond's role and purpose. Without it, he's left as an aimless instrument of imperial power, which, let's be real, isn't very sympathetic. It's therefore fitting in the Dalton era and GoldenEye that Bond followed more of an anti-authority trajectory, which paved the way for what would be the rest of Brosnan's tenure as Bond. From Tomorrow Never Dies onward, the films tried to emphasize Bond's personal and moral autonomy as a way of separating him from the nature of his work, now that there isn't this international struggle defining it. GoldenEye might have been Brosnan's first film, but Tomorrow Never Dies establishes the tone, feel, and kind of stories the franchise is interested in telling moving forward. Where GoldenEye was trying to push the series into uncharted territory, Tomorrow Never Dies is more reflective, embracing and examining the past and the Bond formula through a proto 21st century lens before picking it up where GoldenEye left off in The World Is Not Enough. Brosnan's second film consolidated everything Cubby had achieved and proved that his kids could make a film just as good as what dad made. It's a film that excels at executing the Bond formula to perfection and cements its proven methods as a loving tribute to Cubby's legacy. However, it's important to note that while bringing the most successful elements of the franchise's past forward, Tomorrow Never Dies isn't just an homage. It confidently stands on its own, continuing the examination of Bond's personal and moral autonomy and acting as an almost oracle, predicting the politics and power of the media in our world today. More on that later. And what makes it so effective is it does so within the confines of a familiar structure. As director Roger Spottiswood states, you just have a, a wonderful formula. And it's one of the only films where having a formula actually works for you, because you get to play with it, you get to make changes and then refer to things that are in the past, it's really great. Tomorrow Never Dies is that rare film that's perfect for Bond newbies and veterans alike. If you've never seen a Bond film in your life, Tomorrow Never Dies is about as Bond as you can get. Perfectly encapsulates everything the series is known for and does so with great spectacle and precision. If you're a longtime fan of the franchise, you're getting exactly what you came here for. It delivers on everything you love about Bond through a modern lens, with a new actor, new toys, and boundary-pushing blockbuster action. And to add to that, it was a film tailor-made for Brosnan. His take on the character was so naturally suave, sophisticated, cunning, effortlessly cool, and modern. He had Connery's confidence and seriousness, Moore's charm and comedic timing, Dalton's intensity and understanding of the character, his own special brand of charisma, and when paired with Eon's years-long drive to get him in the tux, amounted to Brosnan being somewhat of the quintessential Bond. I mean, let's be real, taking acting ability and filmography out of it, if you line all of the Bond actors up in a row and ask who James Bond is, you're telling me you're not going to say it's this guy? He just looks and carries himself the way Bond does. The point is, Tomorrow Never Dies cemented Brosnan as the quintessential James Bond, because it was a film written with his specific take on the character in mind. In the same way, the movie itself takes 30 plus years of history that preceded it and distills it into a sleek blockbuster package, Brosnan also finds his footing and defines his portrayal of the character as a kind of amalgamation of everything that came before. Tomorrow Never Dies is the film that firmly establishes his take on Bond going forward forward, and is the kind of movie fans and audiences wanted to see Brosnan in, perfectly playing to his strengths of being more traditional, and the history of Bond actors being more confident in the role their second go-around. But there's also an increased confidence in the production. Nearly all of the Bond films before Tomorrow Never Dies featured casts where the most famous actor was the person playing Bond himself. The rosters were filled with highly respected but low-profile character actors, rather than A-listers. But now with Cubby gone, and Michael and Barbara being left with massive shoes to fill, and a desire to up the ante on Cubby's wishes to perpetually make these films more and more of a Hollywood blockbuster, they found themselves approaching high-profile talent on a level not seen before in the franchise. 
guys. Michelle Yeoh, Terry Hatcher, Jonathan Price, these were all pretty big names to bring to the table. Some big in Hollywood and others internationally. Before Price was even considered, this was also the second Bond film in a row that the one and only Anthony Hopkins was approached for. In GoldenEye, he was the original choice for Alec Trevelyan, and here, he was the original choice for Elliot Carver. And you gotta applaud Eon for taking such inspired big swings. It takes guts, and most importantly, it takes confidence. And while we're on the subject of confidence, take a look at the action in this film. Tomorrow Never Dies is arguably the closest the franchise has ever come to having an entry that is purely a popcorn blockbuster. The film took what Die Hard 2 had done a few years earlier, ramped it up, and almost predicted the path that spy thrillers would go down over the next two decades. I mean, it's pretty difficult for me to see this happen without thinking of how Tomorrow Never Dies beat it to the punch by two decades. Something the Bond films have always done, but especially in Tomorrow Never Dies, is concoct cutting edge action sequences that push the boundaries of action cinema even further. In GoldenEye, Bond arrives in the 90s with great excitement and bombast, signified best in the thrilling tank chase through Moscow, one of the series' finest set pieces. Director Roger Spottiswood was deft enough to understand that there was no way they could top that, let alone repeat it, and so decided to challenge the character's raw skills, intellect, and survival instincts. In GoldenEye, Bond was indestructible, a blunt force of nature. In Tomorrow Never Dies, he's the opposite. Completely exposed and vulnerable on a motorcycle with one hand on a single handle forced to work together with Wei Lin in order to survive. Spottis would use this as a way of escalating the stakes and the tension. By thinking the opposite of Goldeneye, he yielded more fruit to test the characters in new and interesting ways. Sure, you know, a motorcycle jump over a helicopter had been done before. But how could they improve upon that? Start on a motorcycle, few bullet hits follow, the bullet hits increase, the firepower increases, then the helicopter emerges with its firepower, Bond and Waylon are handcuffed together, and Pierce and Michelle are, you know, actually riding the bike. And so they have to work together to drive the motorcycle. She's on the clutch and he's on the acceleration. The helicopter jump is massively impressive for the time and, like much of the action in the film, still holds up today. In fact, just to make another parallel to Mission Impossible Fallout, the same motorcycle stunt performer who was tasked with Tomorrow Never Dies cycle stunts was brought on to add the same intensity and skill to Mission Impossible Fallout. Cubby had always pined for the Bond franchise to reach international blockbuster status status, and with Tomorrow Never Dies, his dream was finally realized. There's undoubtedly some John Woo and James Cameron influences infused throughout, but Spottiswood never goes for a Cameron or Woo knockoff. Tomorrow Never Dies isn't so much chasing a trend, but rather a declaration that James Bond stands shoulder to shoulder with its peers. But it's not just the motorcycle jump that kicks ass, folks. How about that pre-title sequence? There's an entire action thesis statement contained within the pre-title sequence alone. The White Knight segment is like an eight minute short film in its own right. Although it technically has the thinnest thread connecting it to the main body of the film. There's a blink and you'll miss it appearance from Ricky Jay and Admiral Roebuck's impulsive leap without looking clashing with M's calm trust of Bond pays off in the climax. It's definitely one of the pre-title sequences more in the vein of Goldfinger or Octopussy, giving us a mini Bond adventure to whet our appetite. But right off the bat, can we just take a second and talk about David Arnold's score? Listen, John Barry is irreplaceable, but David Arnold comes pretty damn close in his debut Bond effort. I mean, just listen to the way he closes out the intro. This just sounds so, so Bond. And if that 20 second snippet hasn't sold you, then take in this.
But you know what? Okay, back to White Knight. There's something to be said about how Bond doesn't even enter the film for a couple of minutes. We're given the lowdown on what's going on with the Arms Bazaar and an instant deepening of M's character as she faces off against Roebuck. It's only once that cruise missile has been launched and the operation is thrown into turmoil that Bond makes his entrance. Filthy habit. Giving Brosnan one of the best introduction shots in the franchise before launching into action with a simultaneous dose of destructive chaos and calculated, highly skilled focus. It's Brosnan's interpretation of Bond boiled down to eight minutes, kicking ass so quickly that he hasn't got time to take names. But it also shows how Bond isn't afraid to get his hands dirty or disobey commands if he believes it's for the greater good or can save lives. He breaks ranks from Robinson, urging him to pull out and draws fire from a dozen goons as he steals the plane. But ultimately, Bond saves the day and prevents a nuclear catastrophe that would make Chernobyl look like a picnic. And while the film goes bigger, badder, and bolder with the action, with Tomorrow Never Dies being one of the few Bond films to run under two hours, it also marks an expansion of Bond's character. We get earlier hints in The Living Daylights and License to Kill, films released as the world learned more and more about real life government sanctioned killers of Bond becoming less of an attack dog and more an agent within his own autonomy. Even in that pre-title sequence, there's a great reversal of You Only Live Twice opening scenes. In You Only Live Twice, Russia and the US want to leap into War, with Britain as the cooler head in the middle. Here, the British army wants to leap into attack mode, while Bond and M are the ones internally preaching moderation. It strengthens the relationship between Bond and M, who only one film ago were at odds. M seeing Bond as a sexist misogynist dinosaur, and Bond seeing her as a bean counter. Now they've figured one another out and their work is better for it. It's almost like a great reveal when M counters Robux, what the hell is he doing with his job? On the topic of subverting You Only Live Twice, take a look at the character Aki from the film. She's as badass as Bond is and kicks ass throughout her time in the film only to be suddenly and unceremoniously killed off. Kissy Suzuki, who replaces Aki, is fine, and she proves herself to have her own physical abilities in the climax, but it's as if the film teased the idea of a woman being able to do anything Bond can do. In fact, Aki even saves Bond's life at least once, only to insist that such a woman wouldn't be long for this world. Enter Wei Lin. Proving her abilities effortlessly in all of her set pieces, she not only holds her own with Bond, but often takes charge on her own and is one or two steps ahead of him. Take the bike chase. They spend it handcuffed together, yet she moves around him on a speeding bike effortlessly. She's unfazed by anything Bond does on the bike, making her own moves in order to ensure they get out alive. Waylon is also the effort we talked about before of hiring hard-hitting, acclaimed performers so as to up the profile of the franchise, paying off in spades. Michelle Yeoh has an incredible, intangible screen presence that, by proxy, makes Wei Lin an instantly more memorable, interesting, and likable character. It's therefore unsurprising to learn that Eon seriously considered giving her her own Wei Lin spin-off film. Yeoh has so much gravitas as Brosnan, more than enough to carry her own film. On top of that, Yo is an action star in her own right, doing as many of her own stunts as possible. Past efforts to give Bond an equal fall a little bit flat because they were played by actresses who were there to, well, act, and understandably, they're not going to have Barbara Brock rappel down a building or flail around on a moving motorcycle when that isn't her skill set. Unfortunately, the side effect is that Anya Amasova ends up feeling very underused in any given set piece, and The Spy Who Loved Me finds an incredibly clunky way around this problem by suddenly removing her agency and turning her into a damsel in distress for the entire third act of the film. When it comes to Wei Lin, even when she ends up captured, she waits for the right opportunity, kicks ass, and escapes. If there's one drawback to Wei Lin, it's the way she kind uh, hooks up with Bond at the end of the film after having earlier spurned his advances like a true champion. It's arguably the one story beat that the film didn't need, and that comes to light particularly because it's the very last thing that happens in the entire movie. However, on the subject of romance, Paris Carver is, at least on paper, one of the most interesting characters out of the entire series. Bringing back a former flame of Bonds, even if it's one we haven't seen before, opened up a lot of potential real estate. 
Terry Hatcher came into the film with her own star power. They're real oh. and they're spectacular. <laughs> Having just played Lois Lane for four years with appearances in various films as well. Giving Bond's old flame a real life familiar face like Hatcher's kind of fills in the gap of how Paris didn't originate from a past film or Fleming novel. There have been rumors that Paris was actually originally set to be a previously seen Bond girl, specifically Natalia from GoldenEye. That could have been really interesting, particularly in the way it could have tied the films of the franchise together. But maybe it's for the best that they didn't suddenly fridge an iconic or beloved character. Either way, it was a bold idea, and one that Brosnan pushed for, to hint at something in life that Bond can't have because of his line of work, to expose Bond's humanity a bit more. There's this great chemistry between Hatcher and Brosnan that makes their one real scene together when she comes to Bond's hotel believable and it adds somewhat to the impact of when Bond finds her dead. Although it's a little disappointing that the film and Bond move on from Paris' demise almost immediately. It was kind of a dry run for some of the ideas explored further in The World Is Not Enough and then refined in the Craig films. I mean, again, it's hard to watch this moment and not see the through line to this one. I'm not trying to say that Tomorrow Never Dies has the nuanced commentary on love and loss that Casino Royale does, I'm just saying that the impact this film had on the overall franchise is hard to disagree with. If there could have just been one improvement at the time, one thing to really set Tomorrow Never Dies that much further apart, it would have been to let Bond be affected for a longer period of time over Paris' death. It never really seems to specifically be a thing that drives him to bring down Elliot Carver. And for God's sake, don't have him hook up with Wei Lin at the end. Simply put, if Tomorrow Never Dies were a Craig film, you'd have to imagine it would have gone down more like what I just said. But similarly to how Tomorrow Never Dies was a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of exploring Bond's humanity, you could say the same thing about how they were ahead of the curve for the political undertones of the film. It's eerily predictive and layered political commentary, which has been so overlooked as the action sequences are the most talked about element of the film. One of the integral voices behind GoldenEye was Bruce Bruce Fierstein, joining forces with Jeffrey Kane to bring Michael Francis' rip-roaring first draft a little bit more down to earth, Fierstein proved himself to be adept to Bond as a character, but also to the political tectonic shifts that the world had experienced in the early 1990s. His accomplished history as a journalist informed the latter. When it came time for Golden Knight's follow-up, Fierstein had a spark of an idea that, at the time, seemed like a fantastical idea. I was in my hotel room flipping channels one morning between different news networks watching their coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and getting two very different takes on the same story. And it stuck with me. At that moment, I thought the villain would be in the media. What Fierstein probably didn't realize because who could have possibly predicted the media-laden shitstorm we find ourselves in today was that a mere effort to pit Bond against an exaggeration of the already manipulative Rupert Murdoch would end up playing like a vision of the future by the time Murdoch became CEO of 21st Century Fox 15 years later. I mean, now that Murdoch owned properties would help incite any armed insurrection or anything. Oh. Uh, yeah. Well, anyways, back then, Murdoch was only guilty of adding spin to real stories in order to push a right-wing narrative. Now, Elliot Carver engineering the sinking of a ship full of British naval officers in order to spark a war in the South China Sea doesn't seem so fantastical. Fierstein's nine-word pitch for Tomorrow Never Dies was, words are the new weapons, satellites the new artillery. And that's how he got the Bond writing gig for a second time. Suddenly, however, Fierstein found himself amidst one of the most troubled, frantic productions in the franchise's history. You were in the heat of it back then, and you think, this has never happened to anybody in the whole world. It was a movie that was rushed into production. We all had guns to our head, and there was a lot of tension. The truth is, this happens on a lot of movies. Michael and Barbara never panicked. 20 years ago, I could have used the overwrought description that it was like changing engines on a Concorde mid-flight, but since then, I've been on a number of movies that have been exactly the same. To boot, for all the suggestions that the production was troubled, for all of Roger Spottiswood's issues, 
Tomorrow Never Dies is a remarkably coherent, straightforward film that really shows little of its production woes on the surface, while also milking the Bond character for all it can and presenting big, ambitious action set pieces while doing so. That brings us back to the film's story and its villain. Elliot Carver is a man who profits from engineering crisis. It's important to make that distinction. Carver doesn't invent crisis. The crisis he reports on are real. He engineers it. He creates it, almost nonchalant about the consequences. Creating a potential world war between China and Britain? Who cares about the casualties? It'll be great for our ratings. Carver is the perfect post-Cold War villain for Bond. The Cold War is long over by Tomorrow Never Dies, and Goldeneye allowed us to examine Bond's and the Western world's relationship with Russia in its aftermath. Carver now represents the enemy within that remains. Instead of a government or political threat, we're faced with a different and perhaps scarier form of power. A man with the ability to manipulate information itself as the owner of a massive media conglomerate. It's an eerie foretelling of the dangers of 24-hour cable news, especially with the fact that the news is just as revolved around ratings and advertising dollars as it is the actual, well, news. This has become especially true for the kind of outlets that Rupert Murdoch would care to own. Elliot Carver is that man, and he uses his power for absolute evil, treating his actions like Roger Ailes' perversions mixed with Murdoch's own news manipulation turned up to 11 at the time, but now barely a step up from Murdoch's own antics. Ailes has similarities to Carver as well. Ailes was a thoroughly despicable man, an unashamed predator. Look at the controlling way Carver treats his wife Paris, and has her killed when she cheats on him with Bond, an old flame. Ailes would demote or find a way to fire women who wouldn't appease him. Carver has them murdered. There's a really interesting contrast between Bond and Carver here. Bond may be a womanizer, but he is ultimately protective of those he goes to bed with. Carver, on the other hand, unhesitantly murders his wife when she disobeys him. Granted, he also did so as part of a scheme to try and get rid of Bond, but the way Carver orders Paris' death the coldness and calculation insinuates that Bond's death would be a mere additional benefit. There's almost this character thread that goes from License to Kill to Goldeneye to Tomorrow Never Dies where Bond faces off against a mirror part of his personality. In License to Kill, Sanchez values loyalty above everything. He sees this in Bond, allowing the latter to infiltrate his organization, not realizing that it's Bond's own loyalty to his best friend that set him against Sanchez in the first place. In Goldeneye, Alec Trevelyan is a fellow double O, poisoned against the British government by his past, working ruthlessly to destroy it from within, while Bond is just as determined to protect it at all costs. Tomorrow Never Dies, as if to follow the rule of threes, takes this idea to its logical extreme. Carver isn't just a mirror for Bond, he's an antithesis. Which leads me to stuff about Carver being Bond's opposite. Not a reflection in the way Alec or Sanchez are, a complete antithesis. Bond emphasizes brevity and wit, while Carver is verbose and self-indulgent. Bond is a man of action, impulsive and motivated by the gut, while Carver is a man of words. He's calculating and only acts once all the set pieces are in place. Bond is a passionate lover, while Carver is possessive and seems to only see it as a means to an end. And Bond works in the shadows, while Carver is driven by his ego. He needs to be seen, his edifice complex. In the end, Carver wants everyone to look at him like a benevolent god, while Bond just quietly does his work unseen. In the film's end, M even makes up a false story about how Carver died. No glory for Bond, not that he would want it anyway. He may take out Carver in the end, but he does so by working with the Chinese and alerting the Admiral of the deception. He's a team player, and ultimately, it's by working together with Wei Lin and the Navy, MI6, and all of those others that crisis is averted. Carver is incapable of sharing control and glory, and it destroys him. The contrast between Bond and Carver is evident right down to the language they use. Bond is very coded in how he speaks, using double entendres and innuendos, while Carver wants to draw attention to himself. Even in his speech at the opening of his station, he can't help but straight up say the quiet part out loud and admit he wants worldwide domination. Worldwide domination. 
Obviously, in the context of the scene, he's talking about domination over tyranny and misinformation. Even when trying to appear benevolent, he can't help but assert himself as being above everyone. He needs people to revere him, which sort of ties into another big point of contrast, which is each character's relationship with control. Autonomy is a huge thing for Bond. The last few Bond movies before Tomorrow Never Dies are about Bond resisting bureaucracy and doing things on his own terms. So I think it's very interesting that for the first time in probably the whole series, the villain's plan is about robbing people of their autonomy. It's not a I'm going to rule the world sense a la Drax or even a get rich thing like Blofeld. At least not entirely. He wants to create a world where he has total control control over every piece of information people ingest. The media empire Carver presided over represents a loss of our ability to make decisions for ourselves. He wants us to surrender to him. Now, not to cut things off the air in mid-speech, but let's take a moment to acknowledge what Tomorrow Never Dies is. I'm not trying to tell you that it's the ultimate masterpiece of the series or a grand cinematic work. It is, at its core, a balls-to-the-wall popcorn action flick, arguably more so than any other Bond film. It hits the gas and only lets up for a scene or two from the moment Bond throws his first punch to when the stealth boat is blown to pieces. This is James Bond in the pocket, giving audiences all the excitement they've come to expect from the franchise and solidifying even after what had been 35 years, even after the Cold War was long over, that there will always be room for Her Majesty's greatest spy in our cinemas. It's not unreasonable that to say while GoldenEye revived the series commercially, Tomorrow Never Dies was the film that solidified its longevity, influencing the action of the next two Brosnan films and the general application of the Bond formula moving forwards. But that isn't to say Tomorrow Never Dies doesn't have heart to it too. Even though Paris Carver was a new character rather than a returning one, the scenes between her and Bond make her feel familiar and make the idea that she and Bond had a long past relationship feel real. It's a tragic moment when she is killed, and while the film kind of forgets about it for the remainder of its runtime, the scene itself, plus Bond's cold as hell execution of Dr. Kaufman in Revenge, is a standout moment for Brosnan's Bond, if not the entire franchise. There's a lot of rewatch value to this film because of the top tier action sequences, and with the way the world has eerily reflected its villain and plot, it's worth checking out again for that reason as well, especially if you haven't put it on in years. If I could leave you with one thing to think about with Tomorrow Never Dies, it's this. The 90s and Brosnan's era with the character represented the pinnacle of the character connecting with a new generation. For some of us, it was when our parents took us to the theater to see Goldeneye in 1995. But for those of us that were a little bit too young for the return of the franchise, we found Bond on VHS, or we discovered it, like I did, through video games. There are thousands of us who can share profound stories of booting up Goldeneye and the N64 for the first time, and the life-changing impact that it had. For me, it was the Tomorrow Never Dies game. And while that might be a bit against the norm, the things I felt playing that game, the memories I formed, and the path it led me down into becoming the massive Bond fan that I am, were just as profound as those of my friends and peers who were dueling one another on the N64 split screen. For me, Tomorrow Never Dies allowed me to fall in love and, ironically, surrender to the excitement, genius, and timelessness of the James Bond formula. Thanks guys so much for checking out this video. Hopefully I was able to convince you a little bit on Tomorrow Never Dies, at least to give it another watch. I really do feel like it is one of the most underrated films in the franchise, and it's one of the few films I think in the franchise that has only gotten better with age. Like I've been saying this entire video, the, the relevance to what's going on in today's world is just kind of insane. But again, be sure to jump down in the comment section and let me know what your thoughts are on the film. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to like this video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the Film Speak channel for more video essays such as this. Hopefully, we'll be talking about Mortal Kombat next week. I'll know, I'll have a better feel for it once I've seen the film, and hopefully we'll be able to bring you another insightful video essay review on that film. But until then, guys, you can check me out on Twitter at Griff Schiller. All right, that's going to do it for this video guys and I will catch you next time. Take care.